Welcome to Life Plug. This is George G, and the time is right. Welcome to today's guest, strong and powerful Dr. Greg Sadler. Greg, are you ready to do this? I am. Thanks for having me on again. And welcome back. Let's go. Dr. Greg is a professor of philosophy. He's the president of Reason IO. He's an APPA certified philosophical counselor. And I think this is your third or fourth time back on the show. So excited to have you back. Tell us a little bit about your personal life, some more about your work, and why you do what you do. Well, I'm a person who's got his foot in two different fields, you could say, but they're closely connected. So I still do academic philosophy, which is where I started out. I teach for Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design and occasionally for Marquette University, but I do a lot of public facing philosophy and working with professionals. And as you mentioned, I'm an APPA certified philosophical counselor. So I work with individual clients. And uh, so I'm, you know, kind of doing two different closely related jobs. And I like to say that, um, so our motto is, you know, putting philosophy into practice, but I actually tell people that in both of these jobs, I'm, I'm really more of a salesman. What I'm doing is taking products from ancient or medieval or modern philosophy and then repackaging them and, and selling them. And it's really nice to do because if you've got a quality product, you don't have to do a lot of salesmanship or, you know, you don't have to resort to lying to people or things like that. Right. So if you've got a product that sells itself, so long as you don't screw it up, which is what I think philosophy rightly understood is, then uh, it, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun to do. So that's, that's essentially what I've been doing, um, you know, maybe the last decade and a half since I left my uh, full-time position at Fayetteville, Fayetteville State University and then started branching out. But that, that, that's a lot of bio already. I appreciate that. It sells itself as long as we don't screw it up. It seems like that's a, a feature slash bug of the human condition is when things are going well, we have a tendency to screw them up. Why well, is we, that? Have a we have a tendency to like take it easy thought wise, mm -hmm. right? We have this tendency, oh, yeah, things are going to just keep proceeding along for the next five, 10 years and the market won't change or conditions won't change. And I mean, nowadays the rate of change is so quick that we, we can't afford to just coast, I would say for a while. And I think about like what you've done with this podcast. It's gone through some interesting, important changes, right? Um, I imagine that those weren't just knee jerk reactions, but you were like, ah, I think I got to take a look at what's happening down the pike. And you may not have formulated it in terms of philosophy, but if you think about the thought processes that go into it, it probably does fall under that, that rubric. What do you mean from a, like, from a, how, how so from a, from a philosophical well, standpoint? So you know, one of the terms that we often use, which is kind of jargony, is teleology, right? Mm -hmm. And what it means is thinking in terms of uh, where you want to go, your ends or purpose or your goals, and then figuring out how you get there, the means, right? And figuring out what your real goals are and what's driving your what are your motivations? You know, uh, so for example, we were going to talk about wealth in this. Why do people want to be wealthy? Right? Is it so that they can like buy everything under the sun? Well, that's that's one set of goals, right? Or it could be I want to provide for my kids and be able to take care of myself and not be a burden. That's a whole different set of goals, and we could keep on going with that. And then you think about, well, what are you going to do? What do you have to do in order to to get there? And we don't typically think of that sort of reasoning is philosophical, but that's what philosophers from, you know, Plato and Aristotle onward really did talk a lot about. And, and you're not going to get that too much, I would say, in an academic philosophy class, but uh, that's where we can, we can apply it in, in real life. So there's a lot of people, I would say, who are doing practical philosophy without even realizing that's what they're engaged in, because we call it all sorts of other things, you know? Uh, business productivity or, uh, you know, self-help or things along those lines. Do you think that we put a different name on it like that to make it more palatable? No, I think, well, maybe, maybe in some cases, right? Because there's some crowds where if you say, hey, we're going to do some philosophy, 
they their eyes will glaze over and they're they're going to leave the room. But I know I think it's more that philosophers are responsible for this. They the academic philosophers did a lousy job for years and years and years explaining what the hell they were doing to ordinary people and why people should care about it. There's this kind of elitism, right? Like, oh, philosophy, that's for the smart people, not for not for you bums over there. And I think that uh, the philosophers who indulged themselves in that for whatever reasons, maybe they believed it, maybe they just liked, you know, feeling superior to other people, they screwed over the profession by doing that. <laughs> and so now we got to kind of, you know, bring philosophy back front and center, but we got, you know, we got to make a case for it. We can't just uh, say, oh, here's a prestigious thing that you ought to indulge yourself in. Cause that's, that's not, uh, that's not really making a case to anybody. Is that, it strikes me that, that there are, there's always sort of uh, that, that 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 that's happening in so many different aspects of our lives you yeah. have coastal elites and then you have the the deplorable basket of of people it, it, you, you kind of see what i'm saying is that yeah, that is i wouldn't i wouldn't divide it along coastal versus like flyover country because you've got elites all over the midwest and south too right um and and some and it's it's not even like you could say political. There, there are conservative elites. There are liberal elites, and um, you can find them just about anywhere. And then, you know, on the coast, a lot of people got to just make a living too. Yeah. So, um, and I guess I should have just said elites versus people that aren't necessarily. And the those are the wrong terms. Is it is it a function of of it? It's it's. It's 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 a human arc of of oh. meeting my needs and then reaching a level where I'm successful and and I can either remain there or I can realize and kind of get over myself and not be so pompous or highfalutin about it. Yeah, I think that 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 would be a factor in it. I mean, I do think that there is a tendency among many people if they do have if they're elite in some way, they're going to hold on to that, right? Because it makes you feel good to be superior to other people. Um, and then, you know, you can have like crises and realizations and be like, oh, that's maybe not what I should be focused on. You know, people, people grow out of that occasionally, but some people stay with that forever. And there, there is no profession that's immune to that. So you would think that like philosophers, you know, they're super rational, right? They're, they've got this long history of uh, questioning authority and stuff like that. Uh, you know, on the whole, academic philosophers are just about as conformist and prestige driven as any other person. They just have, they're doing it in different modalities. So now, you know, philosophy can help us understand that, as can, you know, other disciplines that are closely connected, like psychology or economics, both of which came out of philosophy originally, or, you know, we could pick and choose others. Um, so, you know, I, I would say to, to sort of bring that to, a, what would you call it, tie it up in a knot, um, there's, a, there's a real helpfulness that philosophy properly understood can bring to the table for a lot of people. Uh, but philosophers, by the way that they're trained, aren't automatically going to be good at that. You got you to appreciate ordinary people and not just talk down to them. You know, you got you to gotta like take their needs and wants and fears and desires seriously enough. And, and that's what I think a lot of the great philosophers throughout history did. You know, um, Aristotle's a great example uh, we we typically think of him as like, you know, he was part of a Greek elite, guaranteed. I mean, he was his dad was a doctor who worked at the court of Philip of Macedon. Uh, he had he didn't have him on uh, phone, but he could like reach out to Alexander the Great and get specimens and stuff like that. But he also, um, you know, he thought that it was important to look at what what problems people had and dig into them and figure out how you could, you could change your motivational structures, how you could like move away from um, 
troublesome traits of character and, and improve your life. So you could have good relationships with other people. These, these are, you know, very relatable things, I think. It's just that a, a lot of times the way it's explained isn't so relatable. This idea or this practice of, or whatever it is, teleology, I've never heard the term before. I love it. Yeah. Uh, it makes me think of the whole, the unexamined life is not worth living. It makes me think about how so few of us, and this, this was me too, I knew how important goal setting was and thinking about my future, but I never did it until I was 35 years old. Yeah. So I feel like there's so many people out there that it's not that we're not capable of doing it. It's just that we're not doing it. Yeah. And maybe you could say there's incentives against doing it too. You know, we live in a culture that sometimes preaches to us, don't consider certain goals because those are just bad goals. You know, like, so if we were going to talk about wealth, you know, a lot of these uh, ancient and medieval philosophers, they didn't look at <clears throat> wealth, whether it's property or income or however we want to conceive of it as a bad thing. But I think there's a lot of people who think that if you are, you know, if you have to make a living and which also, you know, philosophers have to, um, that there's something bad about that you know, or something shameful, like you, sh you're not, you know, looking at really important things. You're, you're worrying too much about uh, the day-to-day -day stuff, but I mean, you and I both have kids and uh, uh, you know, spouses and households. And so we know very well that um, sooner or later you got to get paid <laughs> and somebody's got to pay you mm -hmm. and you know, you got to be willing to ask people for that and sometimes uh, take on extra projects or ask for a raise or do whatever else you need to do. And, uh, you know, or, or going the other way, because that's like money coming in. You could think about like, what are you spending your money on? Are you, are you wasting it on um, products that are not really going to conduce to your happiness, but you're doing because everybody's telling you, you need these sorts of things, you know? Um, well, that's where considering the goals that you, you have can be really helpful. And I, you know, another thing I would say too, we often frame this in terms of like individuals, right? You and I are people that we can decide on our, on our own, but if you are in a, in a matrix, a fabric of relationships, like a marriage or a business partnership or some sort of institution, it's really helpful to have other people in on thinking that stuff through. I mean, my wife has helped me out in a lot of cases by saying, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> what are you thinking with this? And you know, it's not always a, a very um, aggressive challenge or something. So it's, it's asking a useful question. And then we, we, we talk things out. So yeah, that thinking through things teleologically, um, can be very it can be good to have a guide or to have a partner or somebody else you can bounce things off of i couldn't agree more i'm fascinated i talking about money it oftentimes yeah. it oftentimes um it takes rock bottom bad news oh major yeah. problems to actually start doing thinking things yeah making change yeah yeah you know, and, and I, I'm fascinated by that's the behavior gap between what I intellectually understand I ought to be doing and what I actually do. Um, and it strikes me that I, I recently learned about the whole memento mori okay. thing. I'm fascinated yeah. by it. Um, do you, it, it is, so there's a question in here somewhere, but I, I, I don't know exactly what it is other than how do you... How do you motivate people to 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 proactively engage in in tele teleology and and to to act more in 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 their benefit, their yeah, own benefit? I, I suppose. I mean, the the dynamic that you're talking about at the start is something we can see throughout history, right? People, when things are going well, they're like, "Well, system must be working," or "I don't need to think about this sort of stuff. I'm just going to like take it easy." And enjoy and coast along and then it's when things start getting dicey and you know problems are on the horizon or you lose everything that people are like oh man i i really have to rethink things because clearly i had the wrong mindset and so you mentioned being proactive about that and i think that's a great contemporary term for 
you could call it teleology at a meta level. You, you think about, um, okay, so things are going okay for me right now, or even good for me right now. I'm happy with how things are. But if I'm prudent, I should realize that with within the world of um, money or social status or any of these things that that we often call external goods, they can change pretty quickly. And they're they're rather unpredictable, you know, even our bodies, right? As we age, weird stuff starts happening and we're like, yeah, I didn't I didn't think I'd have need to get a gallbladder out or whatever it happens to be, you know. Um, I didn't, but but I, I know people who have. Um, and it's always a big surprise. So we can we can decide to be more mindful and not in the like the clear your head, I'm gonna sit in a corner and just like think about nothing or my breath kind of thing, but being mindful in a more important way, thinking about like, well, what do I want my life to look like? Or how do I want my kids to be doing 20 years from now? And what would I need to do in order to like make those sorts of things happen? Or what do I want to do when my kids are going to leave the house? What is the rest of my life going to look like? What am I going to find valuable? And so being proactive means being thoughtful or mindful about what it is that we need to think through. So philosophy can be be both a, a means to that. It's a way of being thoughtful and proactive, but it could also be uh, part of the end. Maybe you want to do practical philosophy, you know, uh, in, in a very broad sense. So there's all of that stuff uh, going on. The memento mori, right? So being mindful of death sounds very morbid, um, but it's actually super helpful because if you think about like what your life is worth, what it's about and what people would, for example, say about you after you, after you die, you know, oftentimes we have students in ethics classes, particularly business ethics classes, write their own eulogy, right? So they can, and we distinguish between, um, I forget who came up with this idea, eulogy virtues and resume virtues. The resume virtues are the things that you like, um, you know, it's your day-to-day -day stuff. So he showed up to work on time. He was very diligent or something like that. That's a resume virtue. If if the best thing that somebody has to say about you at your funeral is, yeah, he showed up every single day. That's not good. You know, you want it to be more like, well, he was generous or he he was uh, very right. you know attentive to the needs of his family or something along those lines. Or he uh, he found ways to make a lot of money without cheating a whole bunch of people. That's th those are good things, right? So by thinking about being mindful of death, I think that's the best way of translating memento mori. Um, you can help to put things in perspective. You know, a lot of things, you know, in the end, don't matter quite as much as we think they do, like making money, right? But interestingly, um, even these philosophers who didn't have any conception of an afterlife and who thought that death, that's it, they had wills. We know that Aristotle, for example, had a will because it's recorded. Uh, Epicurus, you know, you think about the Epicureans, life is all about pleasure, avoiding pain. Let's live in this comfortable garden together. He gives very specific instructions about what they're supposed to do with the common funds, whose daughter needs to be taken care of, all, all this stuff, right? So why would they care? about that because they realize that their life isn't the whole show that what we can do is set things up well for other people and we can think about the you know if we think in the present about the value of our life that can make us prioritize or deprioritize things that we're doing so i can say you know watching shows on netflix it's fun but maybe that's not the most important thing i should be doing maybe i should uh reach out to somebody I haven't talked to for a while, you know, rebuild that relationship, or I should um, do a little bit of hustling and think about, you know, a, a way that I can earn some money doing some constructive activity that people benefit from, you know? Um, so being mindful of death, I think can be, at least for some people, quite helpful in, you don't have to do, you don't have to like think about death every day in order to do that, but it sure helps. You know? <laughs> I think I, I, I really think that it does. I think uh, that's your, I mean, if you mentioned it's become something new on your radar. Have you been like experimenting with it? Like thinking about 
I had never, I I just had never heard the term. I had heard that Stoics meditated on their death. And so I've been doing that for a long time. Okay. um, Since I started meditating in roughly 2015. Um, So it it is, I could see where people would think it's morbid because it certainly is, but it's more, you know, it's just going to happen. And it helps me to, it yeah. helps me to just 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 to reframe and to consider what is important and what's the most important thing I should be doing. What's the highest and best use of my resources? Yeah. And I could do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but I'm sure that philosophers wouldn't want me to be burning out or to not have any no, time no. off or 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 not. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that we call a philosophical practice. And you could think of this as analogous to practices that you do in other domains of your life, like, you know, exercising, right? I mean, you could, in fact, be at the gym, not 24 hours a day, because you need to sleep, and you also need some some rest time, but you could be like obsessing over your body all the time. And that, you know, there are some people who do that. I don't think that's a particularly happy life. Um, because what about your relationships? What about reading books or, you know, listening to books on, on, uh, I was going to say tape, but you know, that's really dating myself (laughs) (laughs) on MP3 files. Um, what about all the other things that we like to do? Um, and, and this is, this is where like proportion is really important. We want to have a full, well-rounded life with other people that we're sharing a full, well-rounded life with. So we have to say, okay, this gets this amount, this gets this amount. So, you know, considering um, your own mortality, maybe that's a daily practice for five minutes. And, you know, maybe you bring it up every once in a while, like you're visiting somebody in the hospital and they're not doing good. It's kind of a good occasion for thinking that through. So it could be like, you've got your your routines and you've got your opportunities for practicing that. And you could, you could do this with other philosophical practices as well. I think that that's such a valuable thing. Um, I've taken it to thinking about it in terms of what's my working title is rituals of, of success. Mm. So whatever that might be. I like um, that, that uh, rituals rather than just like uh, practices, rituals sounds a bit more, bit more weighty right yeah and i also like proportion okay you know in financial we think about asset allocation right uh, right you know but proportion is is i, I think that that's a, a it's routines versus ritual i think the proportion is better yeah i hadn't thought of that um you're right. When we do think about so income sources and then you know what we're investing in and then what we're spending on, what, what our consumption is. If somebody just has one mainstream of income and it's not something completely reliable, you'd be like, well, that's imprudent. That's that's not smart. And then you know, what are you you could think of the investment part as like, well, we've got my body that I'm gonna like keep, you know relatively healthy. I've got my relationships with people. We've got like, you know, whatever I am doing in my community. And these, these are all things that we make allocations, not just of money, but even more importantly of time and attention and effort. And I kind of like that metaphor and I may actually steal it from you and use it in Please. something else about asset allocation. Uh, Cause that, that's a great way to get that across to people. When you say proportion, people are like, yeah, 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 proportion. Everything needs to be in proportion. Sounds great. But then they don't want to do it. <laughs> so Makes sense, but there's no chance I'm actually going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot of things where it sounds great. And, and this is where, you know, philosophy becomes very practical um, as opposed to merely theoretical. Things can sound wonderful as we're like listening to some, you know, some somebody explaining it and we're like, oh, this is so cool. I'm going to make this part of my life. Well, no, you actually have to do make it part of your life. And that requires all these little anchor points, you know, in, in the day, in the week, in, you know, consulting other people. Am I doing the practice right um, and, and I think a lot of people are less prone to, to, to do that. But more likely if you do find those anchor points 
I mean, oh, it's yeah. it, so much of my life and the success that I've had, it's about habits and, 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 and the routines associated with them and yeah. finding those different anchor points where a ritual is a success. This is when I do a certain thing and it causes me to think about it this way. Yeah. Um, I need to remind myself and I need to be consistently reminded. Otherwise I forget. <laughs> How do you do that? Do you, do you have other people involved in that process of reminding yourself or do you create for yourself like, um, you know, calendar appointments where it'll shoot you a little, you know, reminder and say, Hey, now is the time for doing this. Or do you, do you do it? Can you like do it on your own where you're like, okay, I need to remind myself it's this time of the day. I need to, you, you've got it going out in your mind. You're like talking to yourself or do you do a combination of all three of those or. Yeah, for me, it's definitely a combination. There are certainly uh, some things that are triggered by other human beings, like my kids waking up in the morning that triggers <laughs> certain activities that must be done. I have yeah. plenty of electronic reminders that, you know, if it's just a certain time of the day or the certain kind of time of week that I do certain things, I I have a skull that I wear around my neck that is the memento oh, mori. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and so every time I I I if I'm putting it, uh, taking it off or on, or I feel it, 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 it just, it's a small it's little a reminder. Yeah. Smaller reminder. So yeah, I try and, uh, I try to, once I've decided this is something I want to do or a certain attitude or a certain way that I want to feel, um, I will some, sometimes have a physical thing like, like the yeah. wedding ring is, is certainly another well, one that's too. That's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you're, you're badly off if you're using the wedding ring in the sense of like somebody's flirting with you and you look at your hand and you're like, oh, I'm married. That's right. Uh, I better not do that. <laughs> it can be much more, you know, it can be a lot better in terms of like looking at it and be like, oh, uh, I need to actually like make sure I connect with my spouse who I haven't talked to all day because we're both working really hard about, uh, you know, whatever it's going to be, you know. <laughs> Just give her a compliment, whatever, exactly. whatever it yeah, is, yeah, do something yeah. kind. Yes. Yeah. 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 I hadn't thought about that. I mean, I, I, I've been wearing this one. Well, since we got married, uh, 12, yeah, almost 12 years ago and, uh, rarely take it off, um, and rarely look at it, <laughs> but that's uh, easy. Yeah. Is it... But I, but I'm fortunate in that, you know, we're in almost constant contact because we both work largely from home and uh, do a lot of things together. So, yeah. There's a, it seems like once I get a hold of a quote, I'm like a dog with a bone where I just want to keep using it. And right now it's Samuel Johnson's. We need to be reminded more than we need to be informed. And... Oh, that is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's we, we, we know a lot of the stuff that, 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 that we need. It's the whole, everything I need to know. I learned in kindergarten kind of a thing. So, yeah, which is true. And it's not There's an ocean of stuff that I need to learn still, Greg. <laughs> well, you, you and me both, you know, sometimes people will, cause I've, I've been doing, you know, philosophy in one sense or another, either academically or professionally now for almost 30 years. And people will be like, oh, you know, you've read a lot of stuff and, you know, you're do, putting a lot of stuff out there. Um, must be so wonderful. And I'll be like, well, I mean, the stuff that I've read is just a tiny, tiny little bit of what you could actually possibly read. I don't even know. And I, I kind of suspect that the stuff that I read is pretty valuable and pretty important. You know, I think you probably can't go wrong reading some Plato or Aristotle or the Stoics or, but you know, there's, there's like literally hundreds of thousands of people that I haven't read and I'm never going to get a chance to read, you know? Um, and how do I, you know, it's funny because people will be like, have you read so-and-so? And I'll be like, I've never even heard of them, you know? Um, so it, it's, it's oftentimes somebody who I, whose opinion I value, or I think has their head screwed on straight, they'll say, well, you should really read this person. I'll be like, yeah, I'll see if I can fit it into my, my schedule, you know, and hopefully after I read it, I won't forget half the things that I've, I've read in there. Um, so yeah, uh, there's, there's an awful lot that we need to get from other people. And that's just with reading. I mean, think about like physical exercise in our bodies or um, how to invest our money wisely, or, you know, all, all these myriad matters, how not to screw up our relationships or how to fix them once we've actually 
bollocks them up pretty bad. <laughs> and all too often, the answer is just to do nothing and to kind of keep it going. Well, which is a really sad and terrible way to kind of bring things to a conclusion, Greg. Shame on me. I, I don't think so. I, I think <laughs> in a lot of cases, and I, I do get a lot of clients um, in the philosophical counseling and then sometimes with executive coaching where they're bummed out because they've, they're doing the right thing, but they've kind of hit like a plateau and they're not feeling the same psychological rewards from it. And I'll say, no, it's a great thing that you've actually got that far. And, you know, it might be a year before something cool happens, you know, but you're, it's, it's not without value, the putting in the daily work and continuing on, even if it seems boring or, you know, how, how did you put it, uh, 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 with the going out on something. I mean, what I want to say is these things are positive. We often treat it as if it's a neutral, but it's really a positive. Well said. Well, Greg, thank you so much for coming back on. Where can people yeah. learn more about you? How can people engage with you? So I'm really fortunate and you may get a kick out of this. Uh, in the past, I would say, well, you need to look for me here and this website. If you just Google Gregory Sadler, um, most of my stuff will pop up. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm at the top of the search engine things, at least for Gregory Sadler, which sucks for the many other Greg and Gregory Sadlers that are out there who are working professionals who uh, aren't in like the top page. So if people want to find me, it's, it's easy enough. You know, almost all of my interesting things that people could want to see will be in the first couple search results for Google. Um, and I, I guess if you're like not a Google person, put it in DuckDuckGo or Bing and see what comes up as well. I love it. Well, if you enjoyed this as much as I did, show Greg your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Type into your favorite search engine, Gregory Sadler, S-A-D-L-E-R, and immerse yourself in the world of all things that are Dr. Gregory Sadler. Thanks again, Greg. Thanks for having me on. And until next time, remember... Do your part by doing your best.